So I'm going to pick up on uh, last night. Did you remember how many people, how many men said things like, well, uh, you know, if a woman criticizes me, I have to give in, or that whole theme, wasn't it? It ran through both women and men, not coming out of childhood with mm, go where you want to go. So I'm the same type. So I, I, some of you know that after Bill Stafford died, who wrote a poem every day, I started doing that. And uh, what you do in that tradition is that you, uh, when you wake up in the morning, you look and see what's in your head, where you are. What is it? Sometimes it comes to you as a phrase. Sometimes you have to sort of sift through things to find out the difference between where you think you are and where you actually are. Sometimes your dreams will affect that, and sometimes a little tale of a dream you get a hold of. So on this particular day, uh, I had the, the um, phrase, he made me do it. He made me do it. That is where I was. Probably related to my older brother. He made me do it. The boat with the God beneath. You hear people say things. He made me do it. I never wanted that. A little boat gets pushed out in the sea, and before long the tidal currents guided from beneath. The little sailor goes to sleep. His older brother, when they were boys, set the tone for both brutally, and the younger blames himself for not being more cruel. He must do things right. If he shouted at the sailor, he lowers his eyes. And he meets a woman and marries her, even though he doesn't want to. <coughs> he says, it was a current. <laughs> you ever gotten married that way? <laughs> and he meets a woman and marries her, even though he doesn't want to. He says, it was a current. <laughs> but some tiny black figure swims below the boat, pushing it. This man, or God, works all night. What happens then? Weeks go by, months. A lot of water. The boat hits the gravel. It's an island, the kind where giants live. Don't say you didn't want it. Just get ready. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> what, the whole thing again? <laughs> I had many, uh, many different uh, solutions, but uh, I finally came to this one. <laughs> You hear people say things. He made me do it. I never wanted that. A little boat gets pushed out in the sea, and before long the tidal currents guide it from beneath. The little sailor goes to sleep. His older brother, when they were boys, set the tone for both, brutally. And the younger blames himself for not being more cruel. He must do things right. If he shouted at the sailor, he lowers his eyes. Did you hear that one? And he meets a woman, and he marries her, even though he doesn't want to. He says, it was a current. But some tiny black figure swims below the boat, pushing it. This man, or God, works all night. What happens then? Weeks go by, months, a lot of water. The boat hits the gravel. It's an island the kind where giants live. Don't say you didn't want it. Just get ready. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's, I don't know, it doesn't have a decent title. It's called uh, uh, The Boat with the God Beneath. Okay. I want to give it away the punchline, but <laughs> I gotta call it uh, uh, the anteater's last prayer. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the anteater gets ready. <laughs> the anteater's asshole, but <laughs> the anteater's asshole uh, gets tight. I like the anteater. <laughs> if I put the anteater in, no one would ever figure it out. <laughs> It'll be a, a secret, a secret. The uh, anteater's <laughs> last prayer. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Well, there'll be a whole branch of unions dedicated to Ant Eater, Mr. Stone. I'll, I'll be 192 years old and I'll send, a, I'll send a note saying it's an archetype. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> what did he say? Be like the grill. Oh, yeah, the Ant Eater knows. Yeah, the Ant Eater. of 
last night and perhaps all week in a specific way. Somebody was breaking the windows out of a 1970s Ford. <laughs> Somebody's anger for who knows what shattered a fragile, fragile mirror of sleep, the morning silence and chatter of birds. A sledgehammer in both hands then crashed onto the side of the car, down on the hood, through the front grill and headlights. This humble park street screamed in the rage of a single young man. Nobody got out of their homes. Nobody did anything. The dude kept yelling and tearing into the car. Nobody claimed it. I looked out of the window as he swung again. Next to me was my woman. We had just awakened after a night of lovemaking. Her six-year-old daughter was asleep on a rug in the living room. My woman placed her arms around me and we both watched through the louvered blinds. Pieces of the car tumbled onto steamed asphalt. Man hands to create it. Man hands to destroy it. Something about being so mad and taking it out on your car, anybody's <coughs> car. I mean, cars get killed every day. I understood this pain. And every time he swung down on the metal, I felt the blue heat swimming up in his veins. I sensed the seething eyes staring from his chest, the gleam of sweat on his neck, the anger of a thousand sneers, the storm of bright lights into the abyss of an eyeball. Lonely, out of work, out of time, I knew this pain. I wanted to be there, to yell out with him, to squeeze out the violence that gnawed at his throat. <coughs> I wanted to be the sledgehammer, to be the crush of steel on glass, to be this hungry young man, a woman at my side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whose poem is that? That's uh, Luis Rodriguez. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Jimmy Santiago Baca is a good boy. Yeah. yeah I, you know, we I, should get him here sometime. Yeah. That's right. I'm going to read it in Spanish first. It's called El Fuego. El fuego acuclillado apaga la tristeza del leño, cantándole su triste canción. Y el leño le escucha, consumiéndose hasta olvidar de que fue árbol. The fire, squatting down, uh, basically quiets the sadness of the piece of wood, singing to him his burning song. And the piece of wood listens to him, consuming himself until he forgets that he once was a tree. Rogers, once more, once more. <laughs> this is, I'll read it in Spanish first. You know. Slowly. El, el fuego acuclillado apaga la tristeza del leño, cantándole su ardiente canción. Y el leño le escucha, consumiéndose hasta olvidar de que fue árbol. The fire squatting down you know, lightens or turns off the sadness of the piece of wood, singing to him his burning song. Mm -hmm. And the piece of wood listens to him, consuming himself until he forgot that he once was a tree. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, written by Humberto Acabal. Acabal. From uh, Momostenango. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's Heavy. <laughs> It's from from Guatemala. Yeah. Is a Mayan Indian. Yeah, Akbal. Akbal. This name Akbal. This this is means uh, the gourd from the gourd tree that they drink the sacred drink which you'll be drinking this week. That's what his name means. Yeah. I'm almost the Namo. Give us a little prayer poem since you already a mentioned. A prayer poem. Since you already mentioned the Mayans once. Oh. <clears throat> Prayer poem has to be a translation. Let's see. All right. We'll give one that's simple, hopefully. A thousand hummingbird warriors. A thousand hummingbird warriors. A thousand hummingbird warriors. White ones. Yellow ones. Red ones, green ones, unknown ones, sparkling ones, black ones. They dive into my spine. They dive into my spine. They dive into our spine. They dive into the spine. They come sweeping with their wings. Their wings are bows made of arrows. Their arrows are tipped with dawn. Their wings scrape the glistening off the mother. 
My father with my mother, my father is the sun, my mother is the lake. The glistening is the first child. They scraped that first child off the lake and cast it toward my heart, and cast it toward my heart, and cast it toward my heart, and cast it toward my heart. As it comes weeping, as it comes weeping, as it comes weeping, as it comes weeping. Glistening tears, glistening tears, sparkling tears, unknown tears. That rain, that rain, that rain, that rain on a place unknown where all things jump up and live again and sparkle in the dawn in the flowering mountain umbilicus of life. Where my ancestors' faces, lost in dust, where their ancestors' faces, lost in the dust of their own ancestors, sprout again, living, jumping, playing, flying, dreaming, promising to defend the flowering mountain heart where we sit today, pumping sap, new sap into old trunks. Mm. Long life, sweetness, happiness. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Hmm. In his culture, that's a normal masculine voice. Yeah. Hmm? We have competitions. Like when men get drunk, they don't stand up and fight or tell how many women they laid. They try to outdo each other and devastate each other with beautiful words. The whole idea is to become an akutlah. That means somebody who knows how to search their mouth for beautiful words that can devastate the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> to devastate the enemy means they all want to be your friend. <laughs> the way you say to love, to be well loved, we have no word for love, no word for art. Everyone's an artist. Everybody's in love. The way you say to be loved, it says, means it's not good for me to walk the streets of my village any longer. It sounds like a curse, you know. But what it means is I can't get anywhere because so many people like me, they keep dragging me into their huts to feed me. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to sneak around my village because everybody likes me too much. <laughs> Otherwise, I get nothing done. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> There's no word for leaving. That's what was, I was hearing in France. They were talking about home, and uh, many men were talking about home. In Mayan, you can. There's no word to say leave. You can't leave home. The minute you step out of the womb, you're coming home. So when you see someone going away from the village, they say, um, oh, "Are you coming?" Yes, I'm coming. He says, when are you coming? As soon as I cross that place, I'll be coming. You're always coming home. There's no word for leave. It's very difficult at first to learn this, you know, obviously. But you're always coming home, no matter how far you wander. 2,000 years, you're always coming back. Should I do one more? And what he's saying, uh, you know, more and more, uh, some of the unions and, and uh, some of the women too say, when a man begins to speak uh, in that way, he's speaking out of his feminine side. But I'm more and more suspicious of that. I think he's speaking straight out of his masculine side. And this word devastation <laughs> indicates it's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's female. <laughs> <laughs> this is a poem I, I don't know if it's any good, but I, uh, I was in Canada and I um, was out the, the night after with some people in the room, and there's a young Russian man there, and uh, he simply told this story. And, uh, the next morning I wrote it down, and uh, I'll read it to you. It's about the difference between uh, older men and younger ones to some extent. A man told me this story. We sat in a room in Canada. We all liked paintings. We were all wounded. The man was Russian. On the front, he said they had few doctors. My father's job was this. When it was over, to walk among the men hit, sit down and ask, would you like to die on your own in a few hours, or should I finish it? Most said, don't leave me. He'd sit down. The two would have a cigarette. He'd take out his small notebook, 
We had no dog tags, you know. And write the man's name down. His wife's name, his children, his address, and what he wanted to say. When the cigarette was done, he turned his head to the side. My father finished off 400 men that way during the war. He never went crazy. They were his people. That was a good remark. He never went crazy. They were his people. He came to Toronto. My father in the summers would stand on the lawn with a hose, watering the grass that way. It took a long time. He'd talk to the moon, to the trees, I can hear you growing. He'd say to the grass, we come and go, we're no different from each other. We're all part of something. We have a home. So he'd talk to the moon and to the trees, I can hear you growing. He'd say to the grass, we come and go. We're no different from each other. We're all part of something. We have a home. When I was 13, I said, Dad, do you know they've invented sprinklers now? <laughs> he went on watering the grass. This is my life. Just shut up if you don't understand it. <laughs> But at that moment, the father's got to be strong enough to stand up for what he believes, too, and not all of this stuff. Well, tell me, how you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> Just shut up. 